Oh, did somebody ring the bell? Oh, go ahead and play. Oh, hi. Come on in. So this is my studio. You know Danny. Danny? Hi. Say hi. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming. Um, Danny and I want to play a couple of pieces for you today and talk a little bit about how we approach making music with the trumpet and piano. Right, Dan? I should tell you a little bit about Danny Delgado. He comes from Salamanca in Spain. And we've been working together since about 2016. Yeah. Our last big concert was just before... Well, no, it wasn't just before. It was last summer, 19, 2019 in Miami. International Trumpet Guild conference and we did a nice broad spectrum program and I did a, a lecture and uh, it was the third time I've been there but the first time for you right yeah. and one of the reasons I took a Danny with me is because he speaks Spanish yeah and I thought we were gonna have to speak Spanish all the time because we're in Miami but of course there everybody speaks um, English okay uh, one thing we should do though is I should really close the door so why don't you just pan over to uh, to uh, Danny when I'm closing the door, otherwise we're gonna get too much street noise here. Thanks, this is my studio on Hofstrasse 10 in Würzburg, where I've been teaching and I even live in the back of, back of my studio since 1999. 20 years now, 21 years, was we got 2020, and by the time you see this video, it'll be 2021, depending on when Mike and, and uh, Marty are going to be able to uh, cut it together. Oh, I'd like to really introduce you to, uh, to Marty. Do you think we can do that too? Marty, say hello. This is Marty. He's in my kitchen taking care of business. Hi. Yeah, Martin Hüpfengard. We've been working together how long, Marty? 17 years. 17 years we've been working together. And he's, uh, we usually record in his studio or in different concert halls and whatever. But he's uh, been very nice to come to me today. It's Sunday morning on the 4th of October. Thanks, Marty. Sunday morning on the 4th of October, uh, 2020. And we're keeping our distance because um, it's good for the acoustic. Yeah, it's good for the, no, because of COVID, of course. I've got several instruments <clears throat> that I prepared today. This is a cup that my girlfriend made for me. Uh, I love it, of course, and it always has my coffee. I can't, can't get up in the morning unless drinking my coffee with, out of this cup. Otherwise, it's, the day is not going to work for me. So I'll just leave it right there. <clears throat> so, as usual, Sunday morning. Morning's are always difficult for me. I don't know how it is for you. Uh, one of my... Uh, one of my, uh, uh, they call them four build. What's the word in four build in English? Four build. Example. No, yeah, examples or idols was a man named Rafael Mendez. And this is a wonderful book that was written about Rafael Mendez. He was a Mexican American trumpet player. That's his star on the Walk of, on the Hall, uh, walk of Fame in Los Angeles. And uh, he wrote that he uh, always would arrive one day before a concert, even if it was just with a school band. He would arrive one day before the concert, rehearse with the band, but he never wanted to, re and the day of the concert, of course, also do uh, um, general probe or what they call dress rehearsal, but he would never start before 10 o'clock in the morning. Because we all, all we trumpet players know that our lips are always swollen in the morning and it's a little difficult. So I'm just going to show you how I warm up a little. Dan, can you, you come over here? I'll just leave my trumpet here for a second. You can sit here. Can you uh, make it there without any problems with, with that? <clears throat> there we are. Thanks. So there are all kinds of stories and books and all kinds of theories about how you warm up on the trumpet. Well, when I was a little boy, here I am, 11. Um, my dad gave me, uh, bought me a cornet, the most expensive cornet it was, could buy. It was a Con Constellation cornet. It's right there, standing right there. Um, 
has no mouthpiece, you can see it right there. I still got it, has not a dent on it, not a scratch on it, because I respect my instruments and um, take care of them. And um, in any event, to give somebody for his ninth birthday an instrument that cost in 1964 $360, a kid that never played an instrument, never played, not had done any music before, was quite a risk. But my father had a lot of great expectations in me, if you know the book by Charles Dickens, Great Expectations. In any event, he didn't give me uh, the instrument. He showed me the instrument. He said, you're going to be a cornetist. He told me on my birthday, you're going to be a cornetist. He didn't ask me. This is old style. But... Um, before I could even try the instrument, he said, here's a mouthpiece, and when you can play a nice melody on that mouthpiece, then you can try to play the instrument. So basically, it's about, first of all, playing the mouthpiece. And the mouthpiece is what helps you focus the sound. It's almost like a camera lens, a camera lens. This is a mouthpiece that I had made. It's made by my own company for my form and size of lips. When I was small, I had rather large lips, and also my brother had a lot of trouble playing the, the trumpet. He ended up playing the trombone because his lips were very large. And the mouthpieces that were made at that time were just plain too small. So by the time I was 11 years old, I was playing the biggest mouthpiece that the company Vincent Bach could make in the United States, the biggest mouthpieces in the world, and they were still too small. And it developed a lot of trouble for me until eventually I even played up to the size of a Schilke 24, which is even bigger than a Bach one. And then later I even started making my own mouthpieces to get a cross-sectional diameter that was big enough to fit onto my embouchure. The most important thing about an embouchure is to be able to present the skin on the top lip to the airflow, because that's how you produce the sound. It's not the lips vibrating, it's the skin on the lip that has to vibrate. And it, through the focus of the mouthpiece or the lens that the mouthpiece is, develops a vibration that resonates in the trumpet. The trumpet is not, or the cornet in that case when I was a small boy, it's not an amplifier, it's a resonator. It cannot resonate any sound that you cannot first focus and produce on the mouthpiece or through the skin on your lip. And so <clears throat> when I started playing, my father said, well, and here I'm just going to put the pedal down so you get the resonance of the instrument. That's a sounding B flat. I don't have to roll my lips in. I don't have to make an embouchure any more than present the mouthpiece to my embouchure. And I can even talk to the mouthpiece when I'm talking. So there's really no tension in my embouchure at all. And this is a B flat on the piano, sounding B flat. I usually go down, not up. And I don't play intervals on the trumpet like a lot of people do. The trumpet is a resonator. Don't forget, it can only resonate what you can produce for sound on the mouthpiece or through the vibration of their lips. <laughs> So, putting the pedal down and using the resonance of the instrument. Okay, that's already a pedal C. This is the sound, or this is the, the, the note on the trumpet that's very difficult to get because the trumpet doesn't resonate the pedal C. It's not. It's, that would be the second overtone, or the first overtone, as a matter of fact, the second wave of sound. And it doesn't resonate on the instrument. So what people end up doing is forcing something around with the mouthpiece and whatever. And it's very bad, very detrimental for the embouchure. There are notes that do, in the second octave, below pedal C, resonate on the trumpet. I'm going to play some of that in a cornet solo later. But to try to make a sound that doesn't resonate on the trumpet is very detrimental to your embouchure, and you end up forcing in one or moving some in another way. What I try to do is maintain a, a direct relationship between the mouthpiece and the flow of the air and the pressure of the mouthpiece moving down. So I've almost got no pressure here until I have absolute minimum pressure, and I go down to usually double pedal C.
you can see that there's very, very little difference in the amount of pressure that I use to play a double pedal C, a pedal C, and a low C on the B-flat trumpet, which are B-flat notes on the piano, sounding B-flat. The whole idea is to use your embouchure, use your muscles, use your air form to maintain a basis of absolute relaxation when you play. Because the more tension you have in your playing, the more tension in the muscles of your face, or the faster you're going to fatigue. The more relaxed you are, the longer you can uh, continue to play and concentrate on making music. Herbert Clark, who was the solo cornetist with uh, John Philip Sousa's band, he would play a whole concert as the solo cornet and stand up in the middle and play a solo himself and sit back down and play. And we're going to play a piece by him, the debutante, as soon as I'm a little bit warmed up here. This is the piece here, Herbert L. Clark, the debutante. From my repertoire, was written, uh, printed, first printed by Widmark and Sons in 1912. 1912. Uh, later, it was printed by Carl Fisher, if you're interested in looking for it. I'm sure you can find it. But anyway, Herbert L. Clark said that 90% of playing the trumpet is endurance, or cornet. He wasn't a trumpet player, he was a cornetist. And um, the most important thing is to be able to play long phrases and to be able to play... A and he also said he would never play a piece in a concert unless he could play it perfectly in a row Ten times. Ten times without making one mistake. Then he th said, then it's prepared for a concert. A very, very strict person for himself. And he wrote some very excellent books, technical studies, uh, 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 oh, I have a, 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 uh, uh, this book right here. It's almost the most important book that I have. It happens to be, oh, he setting up drills, elementary studies, technical studies, and characteristic studies. I put this together with some, uh, some other uh, working books, like from, from Max Schlossberg, from New York Philharmonic, and from Jimmy Stamp, from Los Angeles. So this is a very composite book. But Herbert Clark was, um, his elementary studies, his setting up studies, and his technical studies are the most important books that you can own for developing an embouchure, for developing endurance, for developing the, the, uh, the, your playing technique. And he's written this book. Um, this is, these are, this is re, re, uh, facsimile, facsimile, uh, facsimile from uh, uh, Carl Fisher. Yes, Carl Fisher. Here we are, Carl Fisher. 62 Cooper Street, but I don't think exists anymore. It probably was bought out. This is an edition from 1984. So this is how long, and Mr. Clark actually was, um, he also played the viola, and he would have also have to march in a parade with, uh, with John Philip Sousa Band when they came to town. He'd march in a parade, and then they would play sometimes two and three concerts a day, in which every concert he played his own solo piece. I cannot say enough about using books that already exist. The question is how to use them, not what notes have been written, but how to play them. It's not what you practice, it's how you practice. And people have asked me several times, some of my students say, well, why don't you write a book about you know, how to play the trumpet? And I say, well, there's enough books, but there's not enough teaching about how really to practice. And it, you, know, you can write things down and it can be misinterpreted very easily. And the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And the only way you're going to believe that what I say really has a re relevance in terms is to see how I play and how I use the technique exactly as I talk about it. 